Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who love plants. But not always the same ones. I'm Carol Collins. I'm Associate Editor at Fine Gardening Magazine. Hey, Happy New Year, everybody. This is Danielle from Fine Gardening Magazine, and we are joining you today, feeling warm and fuzzy through the holidays. And now that we have come into the doldrums of February, we wanted to talk about something that made us warm and fuzzy inside. Um, so really, we should be talking about bourbon cocktails, if that's that was the case, right? Carol, how do you <laughs> feel about a bourbon cocktail, Carol? I don't know if I've ever had one, to be honest. Oh, all right. Well, that will be the that will be the theme of next week's episode. Um, but today we're actually going to talk instead about our loved ones' favorite plants. And I just want to start right off the bat, Carol. How did you approach this topic of our loved ones' favorite plants? Did you put out a family survey? Well, the, I mean, kind of. But a lot <laughs> of my loved ones are on the other side of the, you know, bridge of life. So, like, I, gotcha. I approached it from the the idea that a lot of us were uh, introduced to gardening by other people, like family, friends, you know, loved ones. And so I have a lot of plants in my garden or plants that I love because like the people that taught me about gardening love them. I love that. Yeah. So, you know, those heartstring plants, you know, something that has you, you every time you see it, you think of Grandma Betty or, or something along those lines. I like that. I like that. Well, I, I went in an opposite direction. I I actually did put out a family survey. So I will have some some funny quotes to read off my cell phone of my family's responses to their favorite plants. So it, it'll we'll have a good dynamic going through this episode. So um Carol, all right, kick me off with your first plant, who the loved one was that is attached to this plant and uh why you love it so much. Okay, so I'm going to start with one that both of my parents loved, and and it's an ephemeral woodland native plant that we would go on expeditions to go, you know, they would knew where some of these plants were, it's a perennial, and we would like go out in the woods and it was like almost, I don't know, like sacred, this plant. So it's Lady Slipper Orchid. That's Cyperpedium reginae, and it is so hardy. It is hardy from zones 2A to 7. Um, and it is, they say in my research, one of the most abundant northeastern U.S. native orchid species, but it is still an event to see this one in the wild. <laughs> right? That is the and, perfect way to explain it, because it is. It is. Yeah, and and so I I grew up in northeastern Vermont, and there there were stands of this orchid growing in the woods that you know my parents knew where. Not everyone went that deep into the woods, and that's a good thing because picking these is not good. Um, they're very pretty, but we should leave them to grow, and that's you know that was like one of the first plant lessons I ever learned in it four or five years old and my parents said, don't touch it, don't pick it. This is, we leave this for nature. And um, it's it's gorgeous though. It's just a beautiful, beautiful old plant. It, uh, it gets about 18 inches tall, a bit wider over time. And, and it can form like a really impressive stand over decades, I think. Um, and it has these soft, green leaves that kind of wrap around the stems and then the orchid flowers just like it's they they call it showy lady slipper the cyperpedium reginae um it is it is so showy it has this little you know slipper like pouch that is rose pink and then this it's surrounded by white petals and um, I actually did have this plant after my mother passed away in 2003 I was gifted um you know, like a, I, I was given money by a relative said, buy something that reminds you, you of her. And I got this from Katie's Falls Nursery. And uh, Layla herself taught me how to, you know, how to plant. It is not a beginner plant. I'm going to say that it is not a beginner plant. It, it needs partial shade, moist, well-drained, organically rich soil, neutral to slightly acidic. and 
um, you, you need to not disturb it. And so I had it in the wrong place. It had too much shade and it didn't flower for a year or two. So I moved it successfully and it, and it did flower and I was so happy. And then we had to move to Connecticut <laughs> and I moved it to Connecticut and it lived in a pot for a year. It flowered in the pot. I planted it in the ground when we bought our house. And I think after that, the voles got it. The, <gasps> it flowered one year. And I think after that, the voles got it. The other thing is that I think it might be a little too hot in the spot that I had it. I think this, this plant really does not like a spot that gets too hot and sunny. This was getting afternoon sun. I was working during the day. I didn't realize it, <laughs> that it was getting baked. That might have been part of the problem but I think the voles really took this one out. I don't know if I'll replace it, but it was fun to grow. I was glad to find that, you know, I was a beginner when I started growing it and I was able to do it, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a cool, cool plant, but I have seen it in the wild since then always will remind me of my folks. Oh my gosh. I love, I love that because it, yeah, I mean, you described it in such a perfect way by saying, you know, you're hiking in the woods or, you know, you're, you're, you know, kind of exploring and you're off trail and you come to an area a lot of times, right, where there's, you know, maybe some pine needle litter going on. And all of a sudden you, if you see a lady slipper in the wild, I mean, it's just, it's mind blowing, you know? I mean, nowadays we drop to our knees, with our cell phones and, you know, try and take a picture of it because, it is an event and it is such a rarity. And I think um, it also has that uh, like almost exotic quality to it because it's an orchid, but we're in New England. So the two shall not meet generally. But oh God, that's a that's a good one. That is a good one. And I love that. You, so Carol mentioned Katie's Falls, Katie's Falls uh, Nursery, uh, no longer open, unfortunately. But that it was a, a a truly amazing gem of a of a specialty nursery that was in. Is it Morrisville, Vermont? That it it's was in Morrisville, Vermont. Yes, and that's where I used to work. I and I lived like five miles south of there in Stowe and. Yeah, it was so nice to have that as my local nursery. <laughs> and I went back there at, and I didn't know they were closed. And I was walking around and Dawn came out and said, <clears throat> this is not open to the public anymore. <laughs> I wanted to cry. I know. Was, yeah, that was a great nursery, though. And it is. Display it... Garden. You did a photo shoot in their display garden, didn't you? Yes, we have them. Um, if you look online at finegardening.com, and maybe we'll drop a link actually into the show notes for this episode. We did an article, yeah, and I got to do a photo shoot on the display gardens that were up there. And when you think of display gardens, you know, you think of almost like nursery beds, but no, these were some of the most spectacular borders that you've ever seen in your life. When when the when the peonies were in bloom there, it was it was an event. That will be our new phrase. It was an event. <laughs> it's such a beautiful spot. Well, so um, I will take a parent a parent plant too, and I'm gonna take my dad's favorite plant. Now, my dad is um, a technological guru. He works with computers. That's his mo. And he was not much of a gardener for I would say the great majority of his life. He has not been a, a gardener. But um, I maybe within the last. 15, 20 years, he has really, in his elder years, <laughs> in his later years, has really gotten into gardening. And it's it's just something that brings him great joy. He lives in uh, Massachusetts and just cannot get enough of the nurseries around his area. I swear if I call him on a Saturday in spring, he is most likely at Weston Nurseries, which is right up the road from him. And he has a cart full of plants. But um, one of the first trees he ever purchased, and it was, you know, it was a little on the pricey side, was a Kusa dogwood. And he, you know, researched the bejesus out of this tree and was really, really into it because he loved dogwood trees when he was a boy growing up the native 
Cornish, Florida, but had seen and experienced a lot of the diseases like the anthracnose that can really affect Cornus, Florida, especially in, you know, a cultivated garden setting. So instead, he decided he had read that they were disease, more disease free and cold hardy, these Coosa dogwoods. So he went and purchased one full sun to partial shade, well drained soil, 15 to 30 feet tall and wide. So on the scale of trees, it's a smaller tree. Um, and this is my dad's baby. He planted this tree in his front yard and he has cultivated it and he has taken pictures of its progress. I think this tree literally has more pictures of its growing up than of me. You know, I, I don't think that he has as many pictures of like my childhood as he does of this tree's childhood. And, you know, now it's in the, I think it's about 15 years old and on occasion it's set little seedlings here and there. And my dad will religiously go out and scoop up the little seedlings and then he will pot them on. But he's convinced that he needs to pot them on for a series of five to six years to then give away to his loved ones and, you know, storied friends, a healthy, well-rooted Kusa dogwood seedling. Um, now I have one of them now in my yard uh, or in my garden. It's about, I don't know, maybe five or six years old. I put a picture in it there, but this is just truly an awesome tree. It's a four season tree. I know a lot of people say that about trees and you're like, oh, great. It looks like brown sticks in winter. But Kusa Dogwood right now, what it has is once it gets mature enough is this beautiful exfoliating bark silver, tan, muscular bark. It really does look like a camouflaged tree from, from a distance. Then it puts out these beautiful oval kind of green, a little bit of texture to them because they're very deeply veined leaves in spring, which is awesome. Gets covered, and I mean covered with some light white uh, they're not actually flowers, they're bracts, but they look like blossoms in mid to late spring. Um, and then you get fruit that follows. And the fruit kind of looks like a hybrid between a raspberry and a strawberry. And the birds don't like them as much as, as the native hard seeded dogwood, but they actually kind of wait until it's almost like rotten on the tree. And then they swoop in and the fruits, the droops are gone within, you know, a day and a half. Um, but really, my favorite part about the Kusa dogwood, and I don't think it's talked about enough, and we've I think I've mentioned it in one of our fall episodes, is it has truly gorgeous fall color. Um, so every year now, I go out when it's in its fall color, and I take a little video on my phone, and I send it to my dad, and I say, thanks for the tree, dad. I'm doing good so far. It's still alive. And then he has to throw in, but is it putting out any seedlings yet? And I have to say no. Carol, I'm going to make you tell a story that you just told while we stopped recording. You have a Coosa dogwood seedling in your yard, correct? I did. And I didn't know that it was there. And my son used to go around with a stick and sort of beat down the bushes where it was getting overgrown. And I think this one got that treatment and it, it, it came through it and it thrived. And now it's like 20 feet tall. It's amazing. Uh. They, they grow pretty quickly when they're young, right? And then... They then do, they sort they of mellow kind of out. out. Yeah, in their old age. But yeah, it's it's so so much fun when they start to flower. It took yes. about I think five years or so before it would actually flower, but and they last longer too, right? Than than the they do than other the Cornish flowering Florida, trees. the flowering dogwood. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So for yeah. myriad reasons, especially since now we've learned it's child proof, it's a child proof <laughs> tree. That's that's a that's a Kusa dogwood is a good one. All right. So uh, what category of plants are we are we falling into next? Annual, perennial, tree shrub, seedling. So I I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do a tree, and actually, this is one that I another one that I have a seedling of. But it's a tree that really reminds me of my dad. Um, it's eastern red cedar. That's Juniperus virginiana, zones two to nine. And note that this is a juniper, not a cedar, despite mm -hmm. its common name. But um, my dad used to love to hang out at the Willoughby Forest in northern Vermont, and at in the, at that site, there are some spectacular old mature red cedar trees, and red cedar needs full sun. 
And so it's not an understory tree. It's not something that grows well with other trees. And so these were are growing around the edge of this lake. Um, and they'll, some of them are just leaning out to get the light. And they're, so they're like over the lake. Um, so that there, there was a cedar log that was, you know, must have been a hundred year old tree. And that, that was like, came up on shore one spring after the like, winter waves. And it, like, everyone just loves these trees in my family and my dad, especially it's, it's a tree that can get uh, 30 to 65 feet tall, uh, eight to 25 feet wide. And it tends to have sort of a upright conical habit. So in the garden, it's not gonna sprawl all over. It's not gonna make a ton of shade like a deciduous tree. In the wild, they generally will get out competed by deciduous trees that jute up and put a canopy up that blocks the light from them. And so sometimes like you'll see them out in the woods and just the top is alive and it's just trying to grow up and get a little more light and they eventually, they, they, they just can't do it. Um, but in the garden, if you have a good spot for it, it's, it's, it's a very attractive plant. It has needle-like leaves, and especially on a young seedling, like the one I found growing in my mulch and then moved into a better position in the garden, it is very, very, very prickly, but in an older tree, the, the leaves are more scale-like and on older branches. So new branches, new growth, prickly, and then it has the scaly branches. It's dioecious, and so it makes these sort of berry-like droops. Um, that then develop the seeds. And it has like this really good color, sort of bluish, a uh, little green mixed in, a little silver mixed in. Um, it tolerates wind, salt, sand, dry, rocky soil. It's deer resistant. The deer do not like the prickly parts. Um, and Bill Kalina included this species and the Western red cedar in native plants for birds, which we had an issue to a one. And again, I'll put a link into the show notes for that awesome article, but it has really good wildlife values. And um, the, the dense habit of it and those prickly you know, needles keep predators away from bird nests. Uh, it's also really good protection for birds in the winter. And it, the, they, a lot of birds really love those droops and get a lot of nutrition out of it. So it's like, it's a, it's a good eco-friendly plant that actually it's, it's native to most of Eastern North America too. And if you're not in Eastern North America, there is a native species for you too. Um, yeah an awesome plant and not one that I usually think of as like a garden plant, but it's like really easy to transplant. And like I said, I got one. I don't know if it came from my neighbor's red cedar across the road or from the mulch itself that it was growing in. <laughs> but I, you know, I found this adorable little seedling and I looked it up, figured out what it was. I was like, yay, it's like hitting the jackpot. <laughs> <laughs> that's so oh man yeah a mulch plant yes that is the jackpot that's like that's better than a compost plant that pops up in the compost so i'm i'm curious if it's almost like it evolved that when it's small and probably more vulnerable to wildlife pressure from like deer eating it and stuff if it evolved like it's really spiky and very, very much unappetizing at that small stage. And then once it gets big and it's kind of out of that, that realm of being nibbled on by deer and, and rabbits and everything else, if at that point it's like, oh, okay, I can soften myself up now. I'm, I'm in the clear. I'm in the clear. It's just my mind thinks in that way. I'm like, oh, evolution is amazing. <laughs> it is. Yeah, definitely. The prickly ones probably survived, especially around here where all the deer are. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that is that's a really good plant. And it's it's really interesting, like where you see them, you know, Eastern Red Cedar popping up in gardens, too, that we have visited. You know, I, I uh, was out in the Cape and got to see in a cottage garden setting that that was one of the trees that they relied upon for structure. Now, you know, they 
get a lot of wind, obviously, and a lot of salt spray, but the eastern red cedar was doing quite well in that environment, which was pretty shocking. And then I've also seen it out in Wisconsin in a zone four garden, you know, kind of doing its own thing out there as well. So it's that that is a tree that's pretty darn tough. Yeah, I, I honestly think it's up goes up to the tundra because it's zones two. I mean, what is hard in a zone two? <laughs> Amazing. I right? don't know. I mean, I know we have listeners in zone two, and we're not picking on zone two, but in our mind, we're thinking that is that is the tundra. <laughs> it's the tundra. All right. Well, you know, I don't I don't do a lot of perennials. We all know that I'm forced sometimes to talk about perennials. I do love perennials. I really do. But I, I tend to not talk about them on this show enough. But one of my um, my plants today is a perennial. And um, forgive me, because I believe two episodes ago, Carol was talking about this plant, but it's my mom's favorite plant, so I have to talk about it, and that's Siberian iris, and that's um, iris uh, sabrinica, or sabriaca, and it's zones three to eight, and it is just, when I think of my mom, I think of irises, um, and it, it's ironic that she was born in May, so she loves this flower. It's her favorite flower, both as a garden plant and as a floral cut flower that blooms right around the time that her birthday is. Um, so my my favorite memory surrounding it is, you know, we grew up very rurally in uh, central Connecticut in the woods. And there was an old abandoned farmstead that we could ride our bikes to. And around this old abandoned farmstead that was kind of off this logging road, there was a stand of these Siberian iris that I can only assume had been planted by the farmer's wife eight bazillion years ago. And we would ride our bikes for my mom's birthday and yes, trespass onto the land. And we would pick a few irises for my mom and then ride our bikes back every May um, for my mom's birthday. And that's, I just, I always see those now blooming, you know, on the side of the road or in somebody's garden. And I think, oh God, I got to look to make sure it's not my mom's birthday <laughs> or, or if it is call her. Um, but yeah, she, you know, there's a reason that I think that she loves this plant so much. And it, it's just, it's a, it's a solid plant that you should build a bed around. You know, it's just a high performing perennial, three feet tall to three feet wide, eventually some really, really solid blade like Kelly green foliage that forms this ry rhizomes by rhizomes, this nice hardy clump. It's full sun to partial shade. It uh, likes moist, well-drained soil, but it will even tolerate wet soil. So a lot of times you will see these, you know, kind of surviving in a boggy type environment or a rain garden, which I think you had brought up, Carol, that it, it, it really doesn't mind wet feet. Um, so uh, the, the main event, though, is, you know, for us, it's late May, early June. So late spring, early summer, you get these really, really hardy kind of darky, darkish purple stems that shoot up out of the center of this grassy like clump. And you get these purple and or white, sometimes yellow. And there's, of course, a myriad of, of cultivars now with different colors, but generally purple or white hooded flowers which are just gorgeous and i think everybody knows what an iris flower looks like you know it's not quite it's larger than a golf ball it's smaller than a baseball these are smaller flowers that don't have all the ruffles and the crinlin and all that hoo-ha that bearded irises do they're just a very simple pure iris blossom um I will say that, you know, if you don't have the real estate for Siberian iris, um, try crested iris. Um, and that is, I would say, Siberian iris. It is the small dwarf ground cover version of that. So, you know, it's, you're going to get that same bluey green foliage. It's only going to get to be about maybe nine to 12 inches tall with those same slightly lighter purple flowers over the top of it. But if you're looking for something that doesn't take up quite as much space as Siberian iris, crested iris is another favorite of my mom. Um, and, and my mom wanted to make sure that we knew that 
it is a beautiful companion to peonies, which came in a close second for her favorites. But um, yeah, Siberian Iris, I think it's a winner. Um, and I felt confident in recommending it because I know you just recommended it too, Carol, is one of your like, I think you said winter's worst, right? It was a, it was a plant that's really good at in through the winter weather as well. Yeah, super, super hardy. Yeah, I love it. I mean, it reminds me of my mom too. Yeah, it's a super awesome plant. All right, so we're coming up on plant three. We have, we have covered some loved ones. We have not covered other loved ones. Who's the next loved ones plant that you have, Carol? All right, so this one's for Grandma Violet, and um, what a great name! Ah, oh, is her favorite plant violets? So everyone would give her things with violets on them. So she had like violet soap dishes and like violet hand towels, and yeah. I did not choose a violet for her though. <laughs> she, she was probably like, stop giving me violets. My favorite is a rose. <laughs> she did love, oh, hybrid teas were one of her favorites too. Oh, oh and she just, she was like one of my very first like serious gardening uh, mentors. Like she showed me that you know, although my parents' vegetable garden was awesome, like there were other things you could do with the garden. And mm -hmm. she she had a lot of really great plants. She was also the family member that got the White Flower Farm catalog. And, you know, <gasps> they send you like a lot of them. So I would get an extra one. And I would look at that more than like any teen magazines or, you know, Vogue or whatever, <laughs> 17 magazine. I would instead be pouring through the pages of the White Flower Farm catalog and just dreaming of something someday when I could have a garden. Um, I love that. Yeah. So, but this is, this is a plant. And I, I was thinking about it. I was like, okay, not a violet. I get that you would not want it to be a violet, grandma. What, what <laughs> would it be? And I, and it just came to, she's like, do, do trailing Arbutus. And oh. yeah. So I have this wonderful memory of, we were there for um spring break i think we would go over they lived about an hour away from us in central vermont we were in northeastern vermont and um so i remember she said we're, when we drive home we're going a, a different way because someone had told her about a wild stand of trailing arbutus and she was like we have to see this <laughs> and um, <laughs> And so we we're you know you draw it's on it's on a dirt road evidently this is like one of their their favorite habitats they love to grow on a bank and for you know one of the sources I read said love they they like to grow near dirt roads I do not know why but it's a perennial subshrub it's native to most of eastern North America as far south as Florida uh, I think past the Mississippi it's 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 got a huge native range, but it's not an enormously uh, prolific what plant. You don't see it just everywhere. Um, but I think in some parts of the country is probably a little more common. Um, it likes partial to full shade. It likes moist, well-drained acidic soil. And so in, if you're looking for it in the wild, look under oaks and pines because they also tend to like that acidic soil. Um, oval leathery evergreen leaves is sort of like a dark olivey green um you know pretty but not like crazy pretty hairy stems that are sort of cinnamon colored and these gorgeous like fragrant white to pink flowers that are like sort of a tr little trumpet shape they're way down next to the ground they only get like two to four inches tall um and so those little flowers are right on the ground but then the you know the name trailing arbutus you can guess it's a it's got a trailing habit so individual stems can get up to like 12 or 14 inches long oh so you can picture it growing on the side of a hill these these stems are sort of cascading down the hill and um I, I thought it was interesting. The Native Trust gave very very specific instructions. It, if you are planting this, they say, site it on a well drained east facing slope under open pine canopy um 
Oh man. All right. Okay. Yeah. I'm out. I'm out. Not all of us have that, right? <laughs> Not all of us have that. And, but this is, a. I always thought, you know, I'll never be able to grow this plant. This is, this thing is impossible. It's everyone says it tra does not transplant well, but there are a number of sources that sell it. And um, like uh, American Meadows has it, but even they admit that it's not easy to grow or rapidly spreading. You do have to kind of look after it, take care of it, make sure that it's got what it needs and move it if it's, you know, if it's not happy. Um, but if you can get it going, it's just like sort of a spectacular spring flowering ground cover. And depending where you are, um, it will, the median flowering date that I saw from uh, a source that tracks this plant in the Appalachian Mountains, the median flowering date is May 4th, but it would be flowering earlier in the south and maybe later further north. So, okay. um, Carol, what is the Latin on this? Is this an Arctostopolis? Oh, I, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't say that at the beginning. Epigea repens or epigea, the, the okay. last name is the um, word for earth from Greek. Yeah. So I think that's Gia or Gaia um, and hardy from zones three to seven. So happier is sort of in the northern part of the range or in the mountains if you're further south. Um, if but it, it does not like hot afternoon sun, which is, I think, why the east facing slope is is suggested as a good site. Mm -hmm for it and and just you know it i think it does love to be on a slope because of the fast draining soil um but yeah well, all so i can that, say is i am definitely going to the podcast notes because i have like in my mind i was thinking oh okay it, it must look like you know arctostaphylis uva ursi or something like that and then now i'm totally thrown off and i need to see what this looks like because i am completely unfamiliar with this plant whatsoever it's yeah, I felt like loved ones favorite plants gave me the license to talk about one that I have not grown myself, right? But, it, oh, but I definitely. definitely, definitely think this was one of my grandmother's favorite plants. And I know she painted it, you know, she painted a picture of it. And, she, you know, she just found it fascinating. I think a lot of people um, like this was an early trigger for wildflower conservation because a lot of people mm -hmm. were collecting it from the wild for those evergreen leaves in the winter and it was starting to disappear in New England. So um, the New England Wildflower Society looks like this is one of the first plants that they they were formed to sort of look after and, and promote and tell people don't cut it from the wild. That's so cool. Well, I will be going to the podcast page on the tab on finegardening.com to see a picture of this amazing trailing Arbutus because I have no clue what it looks like. <laughs> That's incredible. That's a good one. That is a good one. Um, all right. Well, uh, so I'm going to transition to, you know, I mean, I'm a modern day, you know, product of, of, of divorce. So I've got lots of sets of parents. So I'm going to do another parent. I'm going to do my stepfather who, you know, was honestly like one of the first people that popped to mind because he has worked his entire career in the horticulture industry. Um, you know, everything from being a tree warden to, you know, a plant propagator on the West Coast. So, so he is uh, somebody that I was really interested in knowing what his favorite plant is. So I sent out a text and I said, hey, I'm going on a podcast in a couple of days. What's your favorite plant? And so he sent me back a list because he was not willing to <laughs> narrow it down to just one. And he said, tree, as long as it's flowering, storia, ornamental plant, I like elms. As far as a shrub, he likes yak rhododendrons, rhododendron yaku. Uh, his perennial was Siberian iris, so I guess we know why he married my mom. Um, but I decided to go with his favorite deciduous shrub, which is viburnum carlisi. Um, and that is the Korean spice viburnum. It was kind of dealer's choice at that point. And we had talked about a lot of these other plants on other episodes. And I know we've talked about Korean spice viburnum, but I was pretty surprised. Um, I... I didn't think that was going to be his deciduous shrub choice. I, I was a little shocked by that. You know, you think you know a guy. Um, but 
Viburnum car Carlisi is zones four to eight. Um, it is a full sun to par shade plant. I'm going to give a large uh, size range, four to seven feet tall and wide. And here's the thing. Most people prune it pretty religiously to give it a nice shape because if left to its own devices, Korean spice viburnum is a little unruly. Um, and I will full well admit, I let mine get a little unruly. So it is about seven feet tall right now and about maybe four feet wide in my garden, kind of over the place, but I really don't want to prune it that much because the main event with this plant is the flowers that appear in late spring. And it has these clusters of small star-like white flowers that actually are, start out as pink buds. So you're constantly getting that, you know, that kind of, is it pink? Is it white? I'm not sure. And the fragrance on this plant when it is in bloom with these large, you know, snowball shaped flowers is un undescribable. Um, does it smell like root beer? Maybe. Does it smell like fruity pebbles? Maybe. Somebody once told me it smells like baby powder, you know, like the, the you know, that secret deodorant I've heard. I've heard a lot of people describe it a lot of ways, but look, we'll just say that it is a very pleasant smell. You know, this is not a pungent or, you know, offensive smell. Um, so it is a really beautiful shrub as well. It During the rest of the year, it has these glossy, small oval leaves that are a little crunchy. They've got some substance to them. And as a matter of fact, even though it's a deciduous shrub, a lot of times these leaves, especially for us, you know, I'm, I'm in a zone six, those leaves are still hanging on in my garden. Um, generally by uh, end of February into early March, they just give it up and, and they all end up eventually falling to the ground. But it quickly pushes new growth in the spring. Um, it's one of the first things that gives you those little spring signs of life. You'll see these bright green leaves pushing out of this silver bark that it has. Um, but it's just just a really, really interesting shrub. It's um, just, I think it's easy to incorporate into, you know, within other areas of your beds that you've got shrubs and perennials because it's, a, you know, it, it harkens back to maybe a cottage garden style that you really, really, uh, I find easy to work with when you've got a lot of, you know, mixed border going on in your gardens. Um, I should mention that the uh, flowers do give way to these kind of blackish blue droops. And again, this is something that the birds don't immediately feel flock to, but it's almost like they wait for them to kind of start to age out on the shrub and maybe probably soften up a little bit, maybe sweeten up a little bit. And then especially wrens seem to go bananas over these black droops um, a little bit later in the summer and they just come and scoop it all up. Um, it's a really great shrub. Um, and I was just, it was, it was pretty surprising that that was my stepdad's pick. And I was, I was pretty interested to talk about this very, I would say, feminine shrub that he really likes. <laughs> I think he probably likes it too, because he loves to prune things. And then this is a shrub that requires a lot of pruning if you decide to go into that more structured shrub-like appearance. All right, we are barreling towards the end here, and we've got one more plant and one more loved one to discuss. Carol, who is rounding out your list for loved ones and their favorite plants? So this one is sort of a family favorite of multiple people that, that uh, like my parents, my both sets of grandparents love rhubarb. And so oh. I was doing an edible, and my a lot of my family, especially you know, my parents were sort of back to the landers in the seventies, and they always did an edible garden, and only later did started doing um, ornamentals. So there was always, always, always vegetables, and this is a perennial edible, which I think is interesting. There aren't too many of those. Um, so the uh, the the cultivar that our family grew, we called strawberry rhubarb. And I think it's, you know, there are probably a lot of cultivars that are called that. Uh, it has red stems. It's Reum rhubarbum. No, it's <laughs> Reum 
Rabarbarbum, I think it's got a barbum. Rabarbarbum. <laughs> That's okay. I murdered yeah. Sabrina earlier, so <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and it's hardy from zones three to eight. Um, it likes full sun, or if you are in the sort of southern part of the United States, even uh, zone six or higher, which is a lot of the United States is, is zone six or higher, um, it will want some afternoon shade. It doesn't like a lot of hot afternoon sun, but uh, it, it likes sort of moist, well-drained soil, uh, average garden soil. It doesn't really prefer poor rocky soil um but it the other thing that really can't take is wet soil that's the one you know it's it's otherwise pretty carefree but um it cannot be in in water any at, at that standing at any time of the year so my grandparents grew it in a mounded bed that was near their vegetable garden they had about four plants which is sort of the recommended you know if you're going to be harvesting this you need multiple plants um, it is super long lived. It will it will go in the same spot happily for decades. I, I, my entire childhood, it was the same plants that we were getting rhubarb from every year. Um, and I think it's very attractive and could easily be incorporated into an ornamental bed. It's got a mounding habit. It has these huge dark green leaves on the red stalks. Um, and a lot of people don't let it flower because they think that it will make it less productive. But um, the the laid back gardener, the the sadly recently uh, late laid back gardener Larry Hodgson says, don't you don't have to worry about that. Let it flower, enjoy it. It's spectacular. The, the flowers get about they can get six feet tall on a mature plant. Wow. They're frothy white flowers that uh, they kind of looks like this like a giant white astilbe flower. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say if you're growing it, don't worry about it. Let it flower. It will come back fine the next year. You can cut it after the flower finishes so that it doesn't set seed. But um, if if you have it in a spot that it likes, it will eventually get three feet in diameter. And, and you know, it'll just sort of hold that spot for as long as you want it there. Um, for folks who are unfamiliar with rhubarb, if you didn't grow up with it, do not eat the leaves. <laughs> That's one thing. <laughs> rhubarb, uh, it takes a lot to kill you, but it doesn't take much to make you sick. But for that reason, the deer avoid it. You really don't have a problem with herbivores. Um, and it's a great pass along plant. Once you have an established clump, you can tease out a little plant litter too. And once they have a spot of their own, they will grow up quite quickly and form a nice big plant. And um, I actually had a division that my mom had taken from my grandfather's plant. I had it after she passed away and um, and it thrived in a, in a raised bed. I moved to zone six, Connecticut, um, you know, probably a little hot for its preferences. And it, but it did well for four or five years and then the voles got it. Sadly. Oh, those damn voles. <laughs> they are my nemesis. But you know, this this for me, this episode is kind of about impermanence because these loved ones that I'm talking about are all, you know, crossed over on the other side. Um, but yeah, and I some I, of the plants kinda, too. And some of the plants are with them over on the other side of the rainbow bridge, too. <laughs> so, <Aww. laughs> but um you know, I, I, I think that's one of the lessons of gardening, too. It just makes us realize, like, life is precious. You only get a limited amount of time on this, you know, this go around. And so enjoy it and, like, be beautiful like these plants are, you know, in the time that you have. So anyway, right? <laughs> kind no, of philosophical you, for... <laughs> no, I love it. I mean, it is. It's, you know, I mean, we see that a lot of times when we're in the nursery and it's, or you've been pining over a particular plant for a really long time, you know, hey, life is short. Buy the plant. <laughs> Exactly. Plant the plant. Do it. Just do it. Um, but I'm I'm curious because you are such a big vegetable gardener. Have you replaced rhubarb? Do you, are you now do you have rhubarb in your garden now? I'm thinking, so this, writing about it, thinking about it, I think I do need to replace it. I hadn't replaced it yet. And I don't know why I was so attached to the idea that it had to be my grandfather's mm -hmm. rhubarb, but 
any rhubarb will remind me of them. Right. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. I, I, yeah, I am. I'm going to get some more. Definitely. Well, and you do have a kiddo <laughs> that you might need to pass down a piece of said rhubarb that you start growing and just continue that family tradition. I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, there, there might be a day that your son is like, I need a piece of rhubarb, ma, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy him one. <laughs> That's his housewarming present. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Rhubarb is rhubarb is fascinating to me because you know a lot of times we. I, I'm just I'm laughing because you know here we are sitting about in Connecticut talking about oh and then and then I moved to Connecticut and it was too hot and and you know that people in California right now are just laughing hysterically that we're talking about Connecticut being too hot. Um, but I just think that it's it's really interesting, too, to be talking about like, hey, you know, there are things that we wish we could grow that we can't grow. And one of those for me has always been gunnera, which is out west, you know, especially the Pacific Northwest and a little bit, you know, more into Oregon that the, there's this giant, crazy stegosaurus leaved plant that we can never grow here because we're too cold. But rhubarb is kind of like the baby cousin to Gunnera, I feel like in many respects and looks and that whole deal. So, you know, I, I might have to think about growing rhubarb not to eat it, but to actually be ornamental in my baby Gunnera in, in some of my garden beds. I think that might have to happen. Making a note, making a note. <laughs> All right. So, you know, I, 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 I live with somebody, <laughs> a husband, and, uh, you know, he's, he's very supportive of my gardening. I'll call it addiction because it's not quite a hobby. It's an addiction. And he is not a gardener. He is not a gardener at all, but, you know, will cheer me on as I'm moving the 12 yards of mulch, you know, every spring, that sort of thing. But I, I figured, you know, he he enjoys, you know, looking at the garden. So what is his favorite plant? Um, I know this will come as no shock. It was not an agave. He hates those things. He hates dragging them inside every year. We've talked about that. Um, so his response was that gangly looking tree by the stone wall. <laughs> and I was like, gangly looking tree by the stone wall. I don't have any gangly looking trees. But no, he was right, because it's the Horstman's recurved larch that I have down there. And that's Larix decidua, Horstman's recurved. That is zones two to seven. Man, zone two, we are throwing you all sorts of bones today. Um, I'm going to add, because I have talked about this larch before, it's it's one of my conversation pieces in my garden. It's, a, it's, it's just a weird, funky, cool looking tree. Um, we have gotten notes in that people have had a hard time finding this particular cult of our horseman's recurve. So I did some research and Diana is another cult of our of this contorted, twisted, weeping larch. And that is a very good substitute and a little bit easier to find when I was looking for sources. So check out Diana if you had a hard time finding horseman's recurve. This was a tree I got from Caddy's Falls Nursery. Uh, very long time ago, I would say now we're coming up on 11, 12 years ago. Um, it's a slow growing deciduous conifer. So yes, it drops all of its needles, but that shouldn't be a deterrent because it has this incredibly five foot wide by seven foot tall I don't know, twisted, crazy, you stuck your finger in a light socket and now your hair's all frizzed out. Look about it, which is really interesting, especially in winter. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're in February right now. The snow is falling on the branches and you're just looking at this thing going, what in the heck is that thing? But it's just such a cool plant. It's got this really interesting shape to it. In spring, it pushes out bunches of soft green needles out of this, you know, kind of scaly tan bark of it. And then it gets completely covered and clothed in those soft green needles and ends up looking almost like it's got drapery of these curtains of beautiful branches that just kind of flow off the center of the plant. Um, and then in fall, which is when I 
truly fall in love with this plant. It turns a bright yellow color. And this might have been a plant that I mentioned in one of our fall episodes is having fabulous fall color. Um, I think it's really hard to capture in a photo. So uh, I have a video that we're going to put up on the podcast page that you can truly see this tree and all of its as my husband would say, gangly weirdness and really just, you know, putting on a show in the garden. And uh, and it's funny because now I know which, you know, after all these years, what's your favorite plant, honey? Oh, the gangly tree. All right. Well, good to know. Now I know. And that will uh, forever be that loved one's favorite plant. <laughs> and now, because everything sounds better with a British accent, here's Peter to talk about, oh, his favorite loved one's favorite plant. It might surprise you to learn that my wife, Claire, is quite the accomplished gardener. I know I come onto this bi-weekly podcast and do everything I can not to talk about plants, because I assume that you, the listener, can use a break from all that Latin name this and zonal hardness range that, but I live with a passionate gardener, so I do know a bit more about the horticultural realm than I may sometimes let on. As such... In anticipation of this episode, I asked my dear wife what her favourite plant was. The answer? Hellebores. Or as she actually said, Helleborus orientalis. I must say I was rather shocked. I was thinking the showy peony or perhaps aromatic rosemary. But an evergreen workhorse of the shade garden? Nope. Hadn't seen that one coming. But perhaps I shouldn't be surprised. My wife, after all, is the embodiment of the hellebore. She's a born problem solver like the problem-solving hellebore that does not bat an eye in challenging dry shade conditions. She weathers any storm with elegance and grace, like the hellebore which will look winter's worst in the eye and decide, yes, now is the time I will bloom. And my wife is a beauty, with a similar splendour to the stained-glass blossoms of the hellebore. Danielle may take issue with hellebores and their understated presence in the garden, and yes, I do agree that having to crouch down to get a good look at those lovely flowers takes some effort. But isn't that part of the appeal? The hellebore is not for the lazy husband, uh, I mean gardener. You must work to truly appreciate its subtlety and nuances. Now I know what you're thinking. Is he going to talk about the toxicity of the hellebore's leaves? No, no, I will not. And that, my friend, is how you stay married for over 41 years. Well, that was really nice of Peter to give a tribute to his very, very wonderful wife, I shall say. Very nice, yes. True love and plants, they go together like love and marriage. That's right, and a horse and carriage. Now let's see who the carriage is bringing to us for our expert testimony. Hello, I am here with Catherine Cook. She is a landscape designer. She's co-owner of Spring Lake Garden Design with her husband, Ian Gribble. And she has written several articles for fine gardening over the years. We will put links to a couple of those excellent articles in our show notes. Welcome to the podcast, Catherine. Well, thank you, Carol. Thank you for having me. So the theme today is loved one's favorite plants. And what did you think of when I gave you that topic? What was the first thing that came to mind? Well, that's really an an easy question because literally before you even finish the sentence, I immediately thought of my mother (laughs) um, who started me on my gardening journey. Um, uh, Many, 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 many moons ago, too many to even want to talk about, but (laughs) there you are. (laughs) So um, I can still see her uh, rows and peony beds like it was yesterday. Um, And uh, when I thought about what her favorite plants are, it was easy. It was roses, peonies, and azaleas, but honestly, you can't do a a little segment on all three of those families, (laughs) so I narrowed it down to roses. Very good. Yeah, my mother loved roses too. And her favorite were yellow roses. And I have never been able to keep a yellow rose alive. <laughs> Unbelievable. I, I, can't, I That is so funny because um, I am just about to talk to you about Julia Child, which is a beautiful butter colored rose. Um, do you want me to go into that at this point? Or oh, absolutely. You... Uh, Tell okay. us about Julia Child, a great name too for a rose. A fabulous. Fa- and of course, everybody knows who that was named after, that that famous chef. But um, 
she, first of all, I want to, I want full disclosure here. I am not a rose expert by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just a rose lover. So um, my only priorities uh, when buying roses are going to be that they are um, disease resistant, that they are fragrant. Um, and uh, that's really it. Uh, repeat bloomers are great. And Julia Child is a repeat bloomer. And her color is a butter yellow. But the, just, the color is what gets me on that rose because it's just such a subtle color. And um, apparently uh, she chose that rose because the color reminded her of butter, which <laughs> as, a, as a chef, she loved butter in her dishes. So um, that, that was a, that's a funny little aside. Um, You're talking about Julia Child. The, yes. she, she got to choose the rose named. Oh, that's great. That's Isn't fantastic. that great? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And that's the, uh, apparently Tom Carruth, who was the uh, breeder uh, introduced by uh, Tom Carruth. Um, he likes to, to tell that in his lectures um, ab about the, the rose. Um she that you know some people describe the fragrance as like a spiced licorice i can never sort of verbalize what i'm smelling when i'm smelling roses it's just i don't really care about that i just love to smell good roses um and the amazing thing about uh julia child is that she is uh she's hardy from 4a through 10a so that you know that's quite a range um but I can only I only got her to about three feet high and wide when when she was in our garden and 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 it was kind of perfect condition. So um, I think that the fact that I called uh, my friend Carol Patterson, who is the vice president of the Santa Monica, no, so, sorry, Santa Barbara um, Rose Society. Um, and um, she says it basically is a staple, a Southern California staple. And so that tells you a lot about that rose. I think that it, it's, it's big in the Santa Barbara Mission Gardens. Um, and I have a feeling it grows a lot bigger out there and for a lot longer time of bloom, obviously, because of, of their climate. Um, one thing that I was uh, kind of confused about, and this goes to my non-professional uh, knowledge of, of roses is the, um, there was four crosses that made her, not just two. Um, the stock parents of this rose, I'm gonna have to read this, is um, <clears throat> Voodoo times hybrid Rosa Soliniana times summer wine times top notch. So that's four crosses of a rose, which, um, you know, I, I kind of think that's that's quite, quite interesting. Um, Tom Carruth uh, introduced this rose in 2004. Some say 2006, but 2004 was the year Julia Child died. Um, and Carol Patterson writes, I'm going to quote her um, here, so I'll read. We are just about to do a citywide pruning of this city park. And I think she's referring to Santa Barbara Mission, which, if you haven't been, is a, a stunning, stunning park with rose beds. To, if you love roses, that that is an amazing place to visit. Um, <clears throat> but she writes, when people new to roses ask where to go, I usually suggest either the beds of Julia Child or Iceberg. The plants are very forgiving, and usually that area ends up with quite a number of people sitting and talking roses while pruning away. <laughs> so, so that's kind of a nice thought to think about. So there's your yellow rose that you may have luck with, Carol. And it's disease resistant. Like yes. you, you said that yes. was one of your categories. Yeah. Yes. I think but make was, sure she gets full sun. So it yeah. takes, you need full sun. Is that true for all roses generally? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Five to six hours of full sun. Um, I'll get into the whole care of roses a little bit later. But um, for instance, here, when I grew Julia Child here, I only got about five years and then, and then she was a goner. So I'm not sure this climate is the best for her however i still you know i i'll still i'll still buy her every five years because i just enjoy i enjoy the rose but but you know i think in southern california it's kind of incredible long season and a lot of long lived because they're very forgiving plants um so 
And then, of course, there's the dark, glossy leaves. Um, and she makes a great cut flower, uh, dried or fresh. Very and cool. the other feather in her cap are that bees and butterflies and birds flock to her blossom. So that's clearly a pretty good rose to have in your garden, I think. Definitely. Wow, that's <laughs> that's a great one. So yeah, Ju Julia Child, if you like yeah. it buttery, a buttery yeah, butter, rose. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And uh, <clears throat> my next two favorites are climbers. Um, I grew Constance Spry uh, in my, in our old house, um, and she again is you know disease resistant and fragrant. Um, it just it just a, fan, a fantastic bloom. Um, but it was funny because when we bought it, the tag said something about it only growing about ten feet high. Well, Ian, being the horticulturalist that he is, must have dug the perfect hole for a climbing rose because that rose shot up 20 feet. I'm not kidding. It was just enormous. It was just, it was like Jack and the Beanstalk. It was just growing and growing. And it was about six to eight feet wide. And um, it was fun because it, it, in our old house, it faced the road. And <clears throat> She literally would stop cars on the road when it was in bloom. Now she's only a single time bloomer. She is not a repeat bloomer. So you have to just tell yourself, okay, for those 10 days, I'm going to enjoy this gorgeous rose and the fragrance. And for the rest of the year, she has nice, dark, uh, glossy leaves. So it's very pretty you know, green vine on your, on your house, but cars would stop just to look at the rose. Um, and, 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 and I remember when sitting on our side porch and she was growing up the side of it on a hot, humid summer evening, but, well, not summer because it's late spring when she blooms, but oh my, the fragrance, it was intoxicating. It was, it was, it was just sublime. I, I, I just, I just, I love it. The the petals are, are are sort of a pale shell pink on the outside, and a deeper pink on the inside. You know, one and done. But she's a good one. Um, but I just wanted to uh, digress a little bit here, if it's okay with you, Carol, um, because the woman behind the namesake rose, um, I I find really a fascinating life, and it's interesting how the connection to um, cooking and gardening seemed to go together between Julia Child and now when I found out a lot about Constance Fry, it was fun. Um, she's born in Ireland in 1886. Uh, and I, I find her life just so productive. I, she makes me tired just reading about her, but she studied nursing. She worked for the Dublin Red Cross in World War I. Um, but then in, I think it was around 1916, she left England and a violent marriage, unfortunately, to, uh, she left Ireland uh, and the violent marriage to move to England and moved in with her son, who was then living there at the time. Um, she joined the um, civil service. She was a welfare supervisor. And she became, uh, she was appointed headmistress to um uh, a school in East London that taught factory workers um, cookery, uh, dressmaking, and floral arranging, which I, I find amazing that they had schools for that. It just, it, schools for that and for factory workers, which must have been a great thing for them. And then it was in East London that she met her second husband, Henry Spry. Um, after that, she gave up teaching for a while, but she opened up f uh, the first of many floral shops. And those shops became so successful. She was employing 70 odd people. And this was in the 19 early 1930s. <clears throat> and then she published her first book in 34. And she started doing um, arrangements for royal weddings. And this created a lot of buzz, which led to two tours in America. And um, and she continued lecturing all over England to women and um, resumed teaching. Then in World War II, she was instrumental in the Victory Gardens and really encouraging people to grow their own vegetables, eat their own food, and to help the war effort, which, of course, we all know. And Ian remembers his mother talking about, you know, the dig for victory. 
uh, gardens back then. Um, after the war, she opened a domestic science school. She had studied nursing, and then she was going into domestic science with her chef friend called Rosemary Hume. And by the 1950s, she was uh, arranging flowers for Westminster Abbey and Queen Elizabeth's coronation. Um, and in fact, Hume and Spry were the ones that did the, uh, created the dish, the, the quintessential English dish called coronation chicken for Queen Elizabeth's coronation. So that was cool. But then by then, now we're in the 50s, she was really instrumental in bringing antique roses to the fore. She was began cultivating roses in a very, very serious way. And then at that time, David Austin was uh, an amateur breeder. And he crossed, let me look here, Gallica Rosa Bell Isis with the Floribunda Dainty Maid to create Rosa Constance Fry. And um, I think the person, Constance Fry, I think in all she published about 13 books um, on floral arranging, cookery, and gardening. Um, and she died very suddenly in, at the age of 74 by slipping on steps in her home and died an hour later after falling. Oh my goodness. I know. Not a nice not a nice end, but um uh, 1960 wait, that was 1960 and in 1961 David Austin showed Graham Thomas his cross of kind that created Constance Fry and that was introduced in 1961 and Constance Fry is generally thought of as the um first of the modern English roses. So that's just a little a, a, a little backdrop for a, another amazing woman in history who has lucky enough to have roses named after them. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. Danielle and I were talking in the main segment about the, the stories that go with plants and how some, sometimes the stories are, you know, sort of the best part or it's so this is, this definitely proves that point, doesn't it? Yeah. What an interesting person. Yeah. And, and some people have called her a Renaissance woman. I mean, for, for a woman in those times to accomplish what she did, I think was quite extraordinary. And, uh, so yeah, so that that's a, a little backdrop, and but again, the only downside is that she only blooms once, but that's okay for me personally. But if if uh, you're looking for a repeat bloomer, that's sort of I don't think I don't think New Dawn is as vigorous as uh, Constance Fry, but she's a repeat bloomer. She's a shell pink uh, color, fragrant, disease resistant, and of course, very popular. I mean, I think this rose is sort of known by everyone. Um, and it was, um, New Dawn is a sport of um, Dr. Van Fleet. Um, and it grows anywhere from eight to 15 feet, depending on conditions. Um, I said disease resistant, lovely fragrance, and uh, the dark green leaves with lots of red hips in autumn. So this is the gift that keeps on giving, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> So I, go ahead. I imagine you could grow it together with Constant Spry so that you would have, you know, when she was done blooming, you would have a chance of more, you know, more of those pink flowers. Actually, that's a together. great, that's a great idea. That's a really great idea. And one that I never thought of, but that that's a really good idea. I know a lot of people grow Constant Spry and, and New Dawn with clematis, of course. Yes. And, you know, you would choose a clematis that would bloom after, you know, I, I think constant spry is sort of, you know, uh, late spring. And so you want a later blooming clematis to keep the party going. Or if you want a really, you know, statement look, do it all together and just, you know, have a have a party. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a beauty. Um, and, you know, we we have friends who when. Uh, you know, it's kind of like um, magnolia butterflies. That that is also a butter yellow bloom, a very short lived bloom. But man, when she's blooming, we have friends over just to just to see it, just to see it. Um, you know, so right. it's like an event when some of these it's an things event. bloom. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. and and that's cool. okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah cool. So so, uh, but you know, talking about um, 
the, all of these three roses check all my boxes, disease resistant, uh, good fragrance. And um, they, they also um, are soft in color. I, I like the sort of softer colors, the more subtle colors. And, and that kind of brings me to something else, which also um, I'm, I really i have always paid attention to. I, I was a, a photo retoucher in my past life. And so I'm very aware of color and the relationships of color. And to the human eye, our perception of color is of any given color is always deeply affected by the surrounding colors and hues. So when you're choosing um, uh, when you're choosing a, a, a color rose to grow against your house or or, or against a building, um, I think it's important to be aware of the backdrop. Like in our case, those soft shell pinks were really enhanced by the um, gray, the light gray color of our house, our old house. Whereas now our new house is sort of a deep brown cedar. Um, and it's it has a, well, the whole property is different. So it has a different, it doesn't have a different feel. But I think that if you're growing a trellis, uh, you know, on a freestanding trellis, a rose or, or a climber of any kind, maybe the color is less important and it just has to do with what you like. Um, but, you know, if you're doing it against a building, I, I think that's a to really pay attention to how the color responds against the building. And and I'm in good company because Carol Patterson, I keep mentioning her, but she's such a wealth of information, wrote me that Dan Buffano, who is a master rosarian, and also she calls um, a, a gardener or designer to the stars. He does, he's uh, Oprah's rosarian and um, Barbara Streisand. So yeah, we're in good company here. He, she writes, and I'm going to quote her, um, that Dan Buffano also considers backdrops when selecting roses for the beds at the Santa Barbara Mission Gardens. For instance, Rosa Julia Child's buttery yellows complement the sandstone face of the mission. So there you go. There you go. Um, I, you know, don't take my word for it. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, yeah, and you had um, talked about pairing for, for roses earlier. Pairing? Um, pairing, yeah, mm -hmm. the rose care. You know, yes, sunlight, rose care. You know, those, yeah, rose care. Um, and they, you know, pretty much all roses want a good six hours of sunlight. But um, really, an east-facing exposure is the kindest exposure, um, especially for roses, because that morning sun will burn off the nighttime dew and um, prevent fungal diseases. <clears throat> so that's something, and good air circulation also prevents that kind of fungal disease. Um, the other thing to know is that watering, uh, this is good to know about all plants, water deeply because you wanna train the roots. You, you know, let, let's say it's really dry and, and the roses really need water. You want to just put a puddle around the base of the rose and let that seep in as opposed to using a sprinkler because a sprinkler can encourage also foliar diseases. So it not only do you save water by by putting the rope, the, the a slow drip and deep water onto the base, it encourages the roots to grow downward. Um, you want to encourage all roots of all plants to grow downwards where there's more constant moisture. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and and you know, of course, mulching, mulching helps, you know, as well. Absolutely, uh, and they like a nice fertile soil. Is that correct? Absolutely, absolutely. You're giving me a great segue <laughs> because feeding, feeding roses. I go back to my mom. Uh, this was her. This was her thing, and and I I still live by it. Um. You start feeding roses after the forsythia uh, stops blooming. At least this is true for the Northeast. Um, after the forsythia stops blooming, that's when you start feeding roses. And we only use organic fertilizer. Um, uh, and she also told me peonies, which I, I know we're not going to be talking about peonies here, but again, they need their best time to feed 
is in the fall when you cut them back and you cover them with dehydrated cow manure. And then over the winter, it just gently seeps in. So by the springtime, you get a fantastic bloom. But, you know, so those different feeding times, different, you know, different feeding schedules for different plants, which is good to know. Um, they're both heavy feeders, peonies and roses. So, you know, we use uh, organic fertilizer, but um, I'm going to end here with, uh, uh, again, a quote from Carol Patterson. She writes, this is great because I relate to this completely. I am a lazy rose gardener. If the variety doesn't do well in my garden with my limited care, the shovel comes out and the plant is given away. I don't spray chemicals in my garden, but my favorite fertilizers, this is great, this is great, um, are alfalfa horse pellets and make sure they are only pressed alfalfa with no added salt and fish emulsion that I apply with a hose end sprayer a couple of times a year, usually in the spring and fall at the base of the, you know, at the base of the plant. So there you have it. Very good. And I love that it's organic too. These are organic tips. So yeah, Fantastic. yeah. You want to encourage the bees and the birds and the butterflies. And, you know, if you're going to use um, pesticides and herbicides and nasty sprays, it's just defeats kind of the whole purpose of encouraging nature in your garden, I think. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. It has been such a pleasure hearing this, these stories and hearing about these fantastic roses that have such a connection for you. Yeah, they do. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, Carol, I will say overall, I, I love this kind of off topic topic that we did today. It was something a little bit different. And, you know, I, I loved hearing the stories behind everyone's loved one's plants. Yeah. And it just makes me realize like loving plants is partly about loving the people that, you know, shared the plants with you or shared their love of plants with you. It's, it's, I, yeah, I love it for that reason alone. I love gardening. Me too. Me too. 